We walk by faith and not by sight. No gracious words we hear from him who spoke as none e'er spoke, but we believe him near. Amen. Happy Easter, everybody. We had a wonderful Easter celebration here at St. Bart's last Sunday. All the glorious music, the beautiful flowers, the wonderful congregation, hundreds of people joining us in church and online. It was just great to be back together. And as we walked together through a beautiful Holy Week and Easter Sunday, I couldn't help but think back to how things were two years ago, that first Easter in lockdown. I remember how strange it was to be isolating at home on the day that Jesus burst out of the tomb. And in the midst of our Easter joy that year, we were surrounded by so much fear and grief and loss. I remember there were a lot of conversations back then about how when we got through this pandemic, life wouldn't be the same. We wouldn't be the same. The church wouldn't be the same. We might not have known exactly what we meant by that, but we did know that the experience of this pandemic would change us. We began to see that some of the ways we had been doing things just weren't working anymore. And in fact, some things had never worked for a lot of people. Vast economic inequities, a broken healthcare system, racism embedded so deeply we don't even see it, and the harm we're inflicting on our planet. But even in the midst of all that, on Easter in 2020, there was a sense that maybe something new was happening, that transformation was happening, and that maybe we would begin to allow some of those old ways of doing things to die, to make room for new growth. Because you see, the great story of Easter is that death is not the end, and that we have to be willing to let some things die in order to make room for resurrection. I don't know about you, but that Easter Sunday in 2020, for me, felt an awful, like, awful lot like the scene we just heard about in our gospel reading this morning. The disciples huddled behind locked doors, afraid to go out in fear for their lives. On that first Easter night, the disciples were justifiably terrified. Their beloved teacher was dead, and now their lives were in jeopardy too. Everything they had worked for, everything they had hoped for in Jesus was destroyed. Sure, there was that strange report from Mary Magdalene that she had seen the Lord, but no one really believed her. And a couple of them had laid eyes on the empty tomb, but no one really knew what to make of that. So they went into hiding, waiting for the other shoe to drop, waiting for the locked door to be busted in by the authorities who were even now outside hunting them down. But it wasn't the authorities who broke through the door that night. It was the risen Christ who came into that place of fear. He stood among them speaking peace. 
he showed them his wounds as if he needed to prove himself, as if he needed to give evidence for his own suffering. And then he sent them out, breathing into them with the same breath that God breathed into Adam at creation, the one that God had made from the dust of the earth. In this deepest, darkest hour, out of their unfathomable fear and utter hopelessness, the risen Christ brought forth a new creation. The disciples, who had thought their lives were over, were renewed by the gift of the Holy Spirit. With God's very breath inside them, they were empowered to go out into the world, and the paralyzing fear that had gripped them was gone. Now, Thomas wasn't there when this happened. He'd missed out on this experience, and just like when the disciples heard the same report from Mary that she had seen the Lord, he wouldn't believe what they told him. Thomas needed to see Jesus for himself. And not only that, he wanted to see the mark of the nails in his hands and put his fingers in the wounds. Writer and UCC minister Catherine Willis Pershey has called Thomas the patron saint of the secular age. He's definitely the kind of guy we can relate to. And his demand for physical proof sounds totally reasonable to our 21st century ears. Thomas seems to have been a pretty literal-minded fellow. Remember when Jesus told his disciples, you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas was the one who asked, Lord, we do not know the way. We do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Thomas wants proof. Thomas wants a map. We all know that feeling of needing to see something with our own eyes before we'll believe it. Frankly, a little healthy skepticism is probably a good thing these days in this era of fake news and conspiracy theories. Physical proof, hard evidence, peer-reviewed data, these things keep us from falling down the rabbit hole of falsehoods and rumors. They're essential for good science, good government, and equal justice under the law. But what about faith? What about believing in things for which there is no physical evidence? What's a modern day Thomas to do? The writer of John's Gospel must have had just that kind of person in mind, people like us, when he included this story of Thomas in his account. Thomas the skeptic, Thomas the one who questions, the one to whom Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Thomas did want proof of Jesus' resurrection, but he also wanted something else. He wanted what the other disciples had, something he had missed out on, something he saw in them that perhaps he felt lacking in himself. He wanted a direct experience with the risen Christ. So maybe it wasn't so much Thomas's desire for proof, but his desire to believe that Jesus responded to, to give him exactly 
what he asked for, offering his wounds for Thomas to touch. Thomas's desire to believe made room for resurrection to happen right in front of his eyes. From a tangle of missed opportunities, doubts, and uncertainties, Thomas's belief bursts out when he proclaims, my Lord and my God. In a locked room, a new creation is born. We'll witness a another little piece of that new creation in just a moment when we will baptize two beautiful little boys, one of whom is a little noisy and, and happy to be here, Theodore and Benjamin. Through the waters of baptism, Theodore and Benjamin will also share in Christ's resurrection and be welcomed into the body of Christ. All of us here will promise to support them in their life in Christ and will pray together that God gives them inquiring and discerning hearts and a spirit to know and love God, not unlike Thomas, whose knowledge and love of Jesus emerged from his own inquiring and discerning heart. Now we're beginning to emerge from the locked room of the pandemic, or at least into a new phase of it, into that place of transformation and resurrection that we imagined two years ago when all this began. Does it look like what you expected? What new thing is God doing in you? What new thing is God doing in this church? We may not yet have the answers to these questions. We may not know where we're going. We may not even have proof that anything new is happening. But this Easter season, we've heard a rumor that some people have seen the Lord and we want to see him too. So let's keep walking by faith. Let's make room for the resurrection. <laughs>